Thank you, thank you very much. So the first thing you will notice, I will maybe have the worst English accent of the full day because I'm French, so sorry for that. Um, so I'm working closely to the um, edge engineering team. Um, we're writing some articles and writing some frameworks and testing the, the product and talking about these products with your web developer to get some feedbacks. And today we're going to see all the job we have to do to break from the past, from the lovely IE everybody used to love, and uh, we had to do some kind of change. So let's start by why we need we need it really to to build a new engine, and then we will see the job we've done around interoperability and the different things we try to solve with the Microsoft Edge, and finally we will see different new features we've been implementing in our browser. So we had to do a fork from the past. So let's do a brief of history. So I'm I'm looking young because I'm part Asian. I know you cannot see that I'm part from Asian, so I'm Vietnamese, but I'm quite old because I, I was used to i6 as the best brother, you know, so I'm quite old. So let's remember those times. So Internet Explorer was based on the Trident uh, rendering engine, so on the web platform itself. So the engine is named Trident in our case. You all know also Chrome, which is now based on, on Blink. Safari, which is based on the WebKit, and finally, Firefox, which is based on Geeko. So, let's go back in history. Trident was made with the first version of IE in 1995. I don't know, maybe some of you were, wasn't born yet, I don't know. And, and let's remember for the people that as old as I am, what happened during 1995. Windows 95, and a bunch of TV shows, maybe some of you remember. Just to tell you that it's quite old, and we needed to change that. But with i6, we've managed to ship a pretty good browser by that time. But we started to have some issues. We, we had to implement different modes in our engine to let the, the page shooting one of the, our engine, we introduce the doc type mode. Meaning that if you have the doc type tag, it will switch to the strict mode supporting properly the standard. Otherwise, it will switch to the famous quirks, quirks mode you all love. So, oh, and this is a, maybe a bad assumption, I don't know. So, but we had to improve on the, this kind of thing because you know Microsoft is well known to be backward compatible. So there was a lot of corporate accounts and people working in Bing account that wanted us to maintain the way we were, we had some bugs in a way in our engine. So with IE11, starting with i9, we really put eye focus on implementing standard, but we, we had to maintain the, well, some of the oldest engine we had. And with IE11, we had eight different ways to use our engine, which is a nightmare for us to maintain and a nightmare for you to use. So it was quite complex because it was, if that uh, meta tag is available and that, that thing is available, then I will switch to this specific sub-engine. And then we, we were spending our time fixing the bug of that because it was more or less emulating previous uh, way of uh, the, the engine was working. So it was really a nightmare. And we were spending our time fixing that rather than implementing new stuff. In the meantime, Hopefully, there were some great brother that had been shipped. So there was Firefox and Chrome, and there was, well, they don't care about the different doc mode. So they're going to be up to date, and they're going to be auto-updated. But let's view what happened on our side. So there was i5 mode, the quirks mode, the 7 mode, the 8 mode, the 9 mode, the 10 mode, the enterprise mode, and finally, the 11 mode. <laughs> yeah. Now you understand why it was difficult for us. Yeah, you were seeing the, your old good friend working for Mozilla or Google, they were that fast, and you were like, ah, shit, I've got that thing to maintain. So we need to change that. So finally, we decided with Edge to remove all that, to have a single, um, yes. Maybe because I'm talking about Edge, so, you know, with voice recognition, it's running itself. <laughs> And, um, and then we need a new document model. 
just to say that we are not the only ones who have this kind of problem. Uh, it's, it's on the, at the Quirks mode blog, they that all, also with Chromium on the mobile space, they had this kind of issues. So hopefully now you will have Chrome on Android, but it's not that easy to maintain different versions of the engine. And for you developer, it's quite complex to write code that's going to work across all the different versions. So hopefully now, Microsoft Edge is using the Edge HTML, which is a, a fork from Trident. And you see, you're going to see we remove a lot of things and add a, a, enough, a lot of cool things. This is the same browser running rather on desktop and tablet and on Windows Mobile 10 because it's, it's shipped with Windows 10. And it will be across all our devices, including HoloLens or stuff like that. So you will have a, a browser supporting new standards. So it was about the story. So you now know that it was painful for us. So we start when we wrote our new engine to see how the standard was implemented and used by our competitors. And we all know that most of the thing we're working fine is those brother, but we don't really know why. In one of the brother, there was some problem. So let's to try to understand why. So first of all, of course, the web should work for everyone, user, developer, and businesses. This is a promise. It's a promise, I'm sorry. So it's running on a variety of devices. So it could be on an iPad, on a desktop machine, on your favorite Android phones, on a Windows phone. So Windows phone is something being built by Microsoft, uh, if you don't know what we're doing on the phone space, and tablets. So the dream is to write once and to run everywhere. But this is your dream, and our job is to make some specification and to implement them. It's quite complex, to be honest, so it takes time. We need a lot of discussion, and we need to discuss with you also and try to, to implement them. Still, on the desktop uh, side, it works well. Today, if, if you're writing some good code, you will be able to have good rendering results and almost no differences on the JavaScript per space between Firefox, Chrome, and IE11 or Microsoft Edge. On the mobile space, we had a lot of issues. So on the very left part, you've got Firefox OS being, if it's a screenshot of Firefox OS, then an iPhone, and then it was IE on the Windows phone. And you see that the content is being self-called properly on, on the iPhone, and we're going to see why because the developer have made the content for it. And we had some problems. We had the desktop version of AI on the mobile, so you were forced to zoom, so it was very painful. And on, on the Firefox part, I guess there's say some problem with the viewport. So why did we have this problem? Because the, there was some web server code that was saying that if I'm finding Android or iPhone in the user agent, then I'm, I'm making the assumption it's a mobile, so I'm going to serve the mobile version of my code. And otherwise, please serve the desktop version. So what we've been doing is to change our user agent to make us like Android or iPhone. Just doing that, nothing more. And magically, some, most of the websites doing that start to work well on our Windows phone. So we were quite pleased to see that. But let's remember the user agent string, because sometimes people say, oh, Microsoft, what did you do with your user agent string? Steal the Microsoft stuff. And let's see what happened in the past. So Mozilla 5 came from Netscape, being used by Firefox. It also refers to the Gecko engine. Then you've, you can see that Safari is also referencing Gecko in case of someone trying to user sniff that. And then Chrome, of course, that came into the game said that I want to act like Safari and also like Gecko and Netscape. And finally, what we've done that we want to act like everybody, you know? So we are pushing everything in our user engines in order to avoid bad user agent sniffing. And doing that has been has resolved on our side a lot of interoperability problem, meaning most of the websites start to work well in our browser. So if you want to <laughs> detect a mobile, this is a kind of shit you can sometimes see in some code. So in conclusion, please don't do US sniffing. Well, at least, please try to avoid US sniffing as much as possible. Sometimes you need to, de to do it in very specific cases if you want to isolate a bug that you cannot do with feature detection. And let's assume that by default, 
and then the brother is a good brother because it's probably uh, a new modern brother you never heard of. So let's say that a new company writing a new brother won't be stupid enough to use some startup from 1995. So it's probably a good brother. So if you don't know it, please serve the, the latest content of your website. We had some other issues. Um, let's review this website running on IE11 on Windows 8.1. There was some problem with the submenu being displayed, so we had a look to this kind of site. And what we've done, simply in Microsoft Edge, we start aliasing some WebKit, um, some WebKit stuff, uh, prefix stuff, on directly on the latest standard inside Microsoft Edge. For, for, for instance, the WebKit transition has been aliases to classic transition. Just doing that, we've been able to resolve a lot of problems. So we've, we've got a list of prefixes that we are alias to the final version, because we know that we were asking to the web developer to please update your website to use the latest uh, unprefix version of transition animation, well, you name it. But we all know that sometime, well, the interns have left for another job and we don't have access to the source code or, or we are lazy enough not to do it and we don't care about Microsoft, so let's do, not do that. So finally, what we've done is just alias some of the properties to the, to the uh, final one in our engine. So, aliasing was a good idea by that time, uh, but we, I get that the CSS group didn't anticipate all those problems about WebKit prefixes but in production and never being updated in the final source code. So what we're trying to do now, and Firefox has been doing, uh, and Google has been doing with Chrome, is rather than shipping some draft property uh, in production with a prefix, is to enable that to uh, flags inside the browser. So if you type about flags Microsoft Edge, we will see that together in the demo, you will be able to enable or dis disable some of the property or new features. If you want to experiment them with them, it will avoid web developers to put in production non-final stuff that could break the web. So we've been removing a lot of code in IE. So VML, I don't know if you remember VML, which was a kind of something like SVG, but from Microsoft. Attach even has been removed. VBScript, yeah, I'm quite old. Um, current style has been removed. All the layout quirks. Conditional comments has been removed. And a lot of MS prefix events have been removed from our code to, well, to, to have a clean engine and to avoid you to try to do some sniffing of, a, of what the Microsoft brought also. So finally, we've been about to remove uh, 220,000 lines of code from our previous engine. Yes, it's a lot. So to remove six document mode and a lot of um, legacy APIs, and we've been able to add, in the meantime, a free uh, 100,000 lines of code just to support new interrupt fixes and to have some major features being added. So let's jump into the new features. So the good news for us is that maintaining a unique engine uh, helps us to implement a lot of new stuff rather than spending our time maintaining the legacy mode, so it's quite good. So if you want to have a look to what we're doing, so which is part of our new uh, strategy also, it's to be more transparent on, out one, on what we're currently working on. So if you go on status.modern.ie, you will be able to check if you, for instance, let's say that, uh, are you currently supporting web audio or are you working on, well, let's say, I don't, I don't know, a web components, you want to have a look to that, you type for that and you will list we will list if we are currently working on it, if it's already shipped in our product, if we are planning to do it, or if we are not interested at all in, in shipping it. And you will be able to vote for specific, specific features, and based on the thoughts of the developer, it will change our priorities in, in what we will ship in our engine. So feel free to have a look there. You can vote also for specific features you're interested in. What's being av available in Microsoft Edge now, if you, are, you need a Windows 10 machine on a Windows Mobile 10, mobile 10. so there's a lot of stuff around ECMAScript 6, now being called to 2015, and uh, we've got one of the best support of ECMAScript 6. We've got HTTP2, we've got a lot of cool things, but we're going to see to that together through various demos. So let's see what's possible today with just a browser. So I'm working, as, uh, as being said, as a game developer, so I'm writing an 
open source WebGL frameworks named BabylonJS. Uh, because the, the guy I'm working with is a huge fan of the Babylon 5 TV shows. I don't know if you know it. So I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. I guess it's better to be a fan of Star Wars than of these TV shows. But the guy uh, that is fan of the Babylon 5 is my boss. So he's stronger than I, so unfortunately. So we decided to call it Babylon. And let's have a look to what you can do with that. So yes, I'm running a PC with Visual Studio. Don't worry. Everything is under control. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have some sound, and let's review this specific demonstration. It's a little bit scary. So we're currently running a full WebGL scene with Web Audio. So Web Audio is pretty cool because it can help you to put some 3D sound in a 3D scene. And I can move inside the, the scene with pretty good performance. My machine is not a, a very impressive machine, but still we have some fairly good performances. And what we are supporting also is a GamePad API, so I can change to the GamePad camera doing that. And then I can use my favorite controller, which is the Xbox controller moving inside the scene. And I've got some interactivity in the scene, so I can click on specific zone to, to do something. Okay. Keep calm. And let's have a, a quick visit of that. So you can maybe hear some frogs. Yes, because I'm French, so I'm putting frogs everywhere. And if I'm moving far away from the frogs, the sound is being stopped. It's being computed by web audio. I can hear some sound, so I want to click to see what's going on. I can see a skeleton playing pianos. But let's move to the interesting part. We try to put the sim tree over there. So for instance, we all love MLED, so I'm clicking it. I can see some specific stuff. I don't know if you remember about Clippy. Yeah, we decided to kill it, but it's still alive in our art. Let's see now the Schrodinger cat. We never know if it's dead or not, you know. We decided that it is dead, finally. And last but not least, I'm happy to say that we've managed to kill i6. And if I'm clicking on it, we might have fun putting a kind of Batman logo with the Edge logo now. just to do some stupid jokes, OK? <laughs> so I've got a bunch of features to, to show you now. So let's start by, well, I'm a huge fan of web audio, so I'm going to show you what you can do with web audio. So I don't have anything to share about web worker today, so let's do some web, web audio instead. So um, let's switch to another demonstration. And I'm going to explain you how it, is, how it works. So it's again using our framework, so it's WebGL. But what I've done is rather than updating the, the sound position based on where you're looking at, I've attached some sound to the cube. And when I'm going to move the cube inside the right circle, it will pump up the volume. So the, the nearer you are from the center of the circle, the volume will be higher. So it is, the, the idea is to mix some sound, and uh, it's a music I've been composing, so I'm composing some music on my spare time using trackers. I don't know if you know what a tracker is, if you part from the demo scene, it was awesome. So I'm still using them. So uh, I've split my music in, in six tracks and attached that to the cube. So now if I'm moving one of the cube inside the circle, you can see the music being played, and I'm using the web audio equalizer being connected to WebGL particles just for fun. And then I can mix my music like that using mouse. But when you want to switch on a tablet, on a, on a phone, you need touch uh, uh, capabilities. So I'm using Pointer Event. So I don't know if you know about Pointer Event, which is a, a great specification that we've pushed to W3C. The idea is to code uh, for every kind of input using a unique code. So rather than, for instance, monitoring mouse, m mouse move, mouse down, stuff like that, or touch start, touch end, you're going to monitor pointer move, and it will automatically support pen, touch, or the mouse. So now I can use multiple finger to move the cube inside it. 
and it's working fine. And I can even do stupid things like uh, I can grab cube together, so let's do that. And I'm building the French part of my music. So this is cool because I'm using Pointer Evans. The problem of Pointer Evans, I don't know if it's really a problem, but it's only working on i11 and Microsoft Edge. And apparently the broader uh, market share has changed a bit, so we need to support other broader. So we decided to write a polyfill library to, uh, to support other browser. So Firefox has recently announced, and you can test pointer events in latest build of Firefox, nightly builds. So it's working fine also within Chrome. So I can have uh, multi-touch being supported inside Chrome. Using an open source library we've been working on with my friend David named n.js. So if you want to have a look into that, you can code today against the pointer events, reference this library. And what we will do, we will generate on the fly a touch event if it's not supported by the browser. It, the idea is to let you test today this specification and to make it available on Firefox OS, Android, or iPhone if they're not supporting yet pointer events. So this demonstration is being available on one of our GitHub if you want to have a look too. So let's view another thing. So CSS filter, it's quite simple to use. So let's review the code. So let's first run that in Microsoft Edge. And you can see that it's supposed to, yes, my friend, my other friend is also a huge fan of the magic cards. I don't know if you know what's that. So it very, well, he's, he's very, very weird, my friend. So, uh, but he's still my boss, so I'm maximum respect. And um, the, what he would like to do, so his idea was when you read the, the, the text, maybe you want to put the focus on the text. Maybe you want slightly to do a blurring effect on the background image. Currently, it doesn't work because I was explaining you that you know to go to about flags and then to enable in the about flags this, this specific feature, which is the CSS filter property. So let's enable that. You need to restart the browser to take that into account and then review the same demonstration. And now it's working fine. You see, if I'm moving the, the mouse out of the text, the blur effect is being removed. If I'm moving inside it, it's then being applied. And I can play with the level of effect of the blurring effect. What is cool, it's, it's very easy to implement. It's just that. So you've got the final one to use, then the, the various prefixes version you need to use. And then you need to say the level of blurring effects you need to apply. And the other cool news is that it's being done on the GPU side, meaning that it won't have a real impact of the performance inside the browser. So it's being handled by the C++ part of the browser and being hardware accelerated if you want to. So it's very easy to use. And now you need to find the best cases. We are developer. We are not UX designer, as you can see. But it's pretty easy to, to implement. Let's switch to another demonstration. I can't remember the, the next one. Yes, source set. So Microsoft Edge is shipping source, source set. So if you don't know what source set is, it's very, uh, very nice. The idea is when you're running a different side of images for mobile or retina screen like with well, IDPI screens, most of the time we were using the, the classic source property and providing a specific image. But what happens if this image is too, with too, re too much resolution or too, not enough resolution? You need to detect what the, bro the con well, viewport is supporting and then to provide another image. So sometimes you were downloading two images, or sometimes you were pushing some too high quality image to a device that doesn't support it. So the idea of source sets is to be able to, to provide a set of different images based on the current DPI you want to use. So we're going to see that together. So you're going to say there's there are different rules to be applied. And to be honest, it's not quite uh, obvious how to use it. So there's still a lot of articles being written by different people to make some good tutorial. So I've been using this, the simplest one, at least the one that I understand. Okay, And we will see that together. So let's open that in Microsoft Edge. By default, I'm currently using a cl normal zoom. And to simulate the fact that I will have a higher DPI screen, I'm going to zoom. And I'm going also to open our F12 tools to see the networking part. 
So let's zoom. And let's say now I've got a very high DPI screen. I'm going to refresh. And you see that now I've downloaded the 2x version of the image, meaning that I've got a better resolution. Maybe I don't know if you can see that on the screen, because it's really difficult. Maybe you can see that. So you manage to provide um, different version of your image with different DPIs. And this is a broader job to, to choose the best image to download and to display on your current screen. You, you don't have to figure out which is the current DPI of the screen, of the screen of the people going to go to the website. It's being done by the, by the browser itself. And of course, I can even go further. You see, I've got IS detailed image. And you see that the browser has been downloading only the 4x four, four version of the image. So it, is not, it, it doesn't download all versions of the image. So let's switch back to the normal zoom. OK. And I've been playing with that. So I'm currently updating my website, the Babylon GS website, uh, to use Flexbox. So I, I rather prefer writing JavaScript than writing CSS, so, but Flexbox is so cool that I'm trying to use it. And I've, I've mixed, though, media queries and Flexbox things to update my website using that, to be responsive in a way. And uh, you can mix, of course, all that by zooming a, a bit. And you will see that I'm refreshing the broader. Then I'm using some IS definition image. So you can mix a lot of different things now. I'm currently using Flexbox, media queries, and source set images inside the browser to help you building some cool responsive websites and to avoid downloading um, too much bits on the network to do that. So what is my next demonstration? Yes, ECMAScript 6. So I don't know if I've got access to the network. I guess I've lost it. Yes. Otherwise, I will have some other demonstration. I'm connected back. Let's hope so. Yes. So I don't know if you know about TypeScript. So TypeScript is being made by Microsoft. And we've got some good feedbacks. And which is rare when we are shipping stuff on the web. <laughs> so I'm quite happy about that. And um, it's currently a super set of JavaScript. And you can already use uh, ECMAScript 6 features. And it's going to compile it to ECMAScript 5 things. So for instance, here you've got the class keyword uh, for people that are not coming from a JavaScript background. So most of the time when you're working with C Sharp or Java or C++ developer, you know that they, oh my god, but you can't do object-oriented programming using JavaScript? Yes, now you can. <laughs> you've got the class keyword, the constructor keyword, keep calm. But what we're doing in the background, we're just using some classic pattern. You all know it's using the module pattern, and, and we're doing the job for them. So they can start learning that. TypeScript is a superset of, of JavaScript, but it's also adding the typing system. So for instance, let's take this specific piece of code. And let's go to code pen, for instance. Let's do a new one. So I'm going to copy paste that over there. I've got some errors because I'm using the typing that we don't have in JavaScript today. So let's remove everything linked to the type. And you can see that I've got then the class keyword, the constructor keyword working fine. And now you can see I've got the say hello button that's it working. So today you can already start using other ECMAScript 6 using TypeScript or Babel, maybe you know Babel, JS, you know that. Cross compile that to ECMAScript 5. And the beauty of that is when you've got your TypeScript code, uh, if old brother is are supporting correctly ECMAScript 6, you can ask the compiler to compile uh, rather than the ECMAScript 5, the ECMAScript 6 version of the code. So hopefully we've been using that to create our framework. So let's move that. So let's load the scene to show you. And I can, of course, debug that. So I'm currently using the, you can see that I'm currently running some XMAX script 6 code using the class and constructor. And I'm going then to load the scene. So 
switch the camera to the gamepad camera. And you see that can now debug my code. And what people are not really used, I've got a super keyword, so I'm pressing F11. I can then switch to the, to the main classes, because you can use also the extend keywords like you're used to in C Sharp or Java. So people are not lost. And in the background, what we're doing is really using some classical JavaScript code. This isn't only some sugar thing we're putting on top of JavaScript, but it could be helpful for people. We also have some cool things like the URL um, function. I don't know. Yes, I've got one here. You can see these specific things, because also people coming from C Sharp or Java are not used to the closure thing. You know, the, this is not the this I was expecting to be. Oh my God, what happened? So what to, to, it, uh, to hide that, we decided to insert what was named the Lambda expression in C Sharp and it's a row function in JavaScript. So it's going really to say that the current this will be automatically mapped to the var that equal this for you uh, in the background. It's really to do some kind of async call stuff like that and to have a, a cleaner code like that. And it's going to create, you see, an, uh, an anonymous function for you. So it's quite uh, fun to use. And if I'm putting a breakpoint break over there, of course, I can still debug the code. So I need to move a little bit. And you see, uh, not here. You see I'm currently inside the Euro function, and I'm still being able to debug it in a normal way. So fairly obvious. Let's close everything. OK. So it was ECMAScript. We've got a lot of things being supported, so um, we'll let you having a review about that. So now let's move to fun stuff. HTTP2. So it's enabled by default in Microsoft Edge, obviously. So it's thanks to the job being done by Google. So maybe you had some problem when you were using HTTP 1.1. So to improve the performance, a lot of people were doing some kind of hacks and tricks. So for instance, by default, normally in most of the browser, you, need to, you cannot, cannot only do four parallel requests uh, on the server using HTTP 1.1, plus the fact that you had a lot of round trip to, to communicate and action with the server. So to solve that, most of the people were using different CDN because it was domain-based. So they were putting, for instance, four images on a specific CDN, four other images on another one to simulate the fact they had more uh, uh, parallel request. In HTTP2, you don't, you don't have to do that anymore. This is by default. You have a unit rec request. It's going to stream all the different uh, requests inside a unique connection, and you will have much faster uh, connection. So it's really good for the mobile. And also, you have different things like you we are not using anymore a text unconnect stuff using HTTP. In HTTP2, it's binary based, so it's take less bandwidth. And finally, we have a bunch of things like trying to to anticipate what you need to push some information from the server. And this website from Google is very interesting because it's using an HTTP2 stack on the server. And it also helps you to simulate some latency. So for instance, let's imagine that you've got an HTTP1 connection with 30 millisecond, millisecond latency. You can to see that it's going to load them in a serial way, because it's going to, to launch four requests, then four requests, waiting for the four requests to, to finish. Uh, and then when the four requests are finished, going to send four new ones. So they need to wait for the previous one to be done. If I'm using it HTTP2, it's quite visual. You see the speed you've got to load some image. Now just imagine that with all the resources you've got on the server, it's really speed up the, the loading time uh, just by enabling HTTP2 on the server. The good thing is that the, the verbs being used and the comments are backward compatible. You're not forced to learn some new things. So it's fairly transparent for you as a front-end developer. It's just enabling HTTP2. It will be done by the server, and the browser is taking care of that. So it's really, really awesome, so, and feel free to use it, because if it's not supported by the brother, obviously we will fall back on HTTP 1.1. So we've got two final demonstrations, a stupid one, and very interesting one I'm very passionate about. So let's start by the stupid one, if you don't mind. So in the past, what we could do in IE11 was to support um, SVG element inside an HTML5 document. Uh, 
And what we introduced with the foreign object is being able to do more or less the opposite, to take some HTML content and put that inside an SVG document. So you've got an HTML5 document, an SVG uh, viewport over there, some filter, so SVG filtering, and then I've got the foreign object tag, meaning that I want to embed a specific iframe, okay? So I'm not very good in finding use cases, so we decided to load an iframe and to navigate to a specific site and to do this kind of fun stuff. What are you going to tell me? It's the drunken version of a browser, you know? You are in a party, you've, dry, you've, dry, dry, you've been drinking a lot of alcohol. I don't drink any alcohol, so I don't know how it should look like when you're drunk, so maybe some of you know, I don't know. And the idea is maybe to do some user testing. If you're not drunk, you want to test your website when you're drunk, you can uh, apply this SVG filter and, for instance, search for a specific thing. See, it's quite complex, try to click, oh my god. It's quite complex, so just maybe, maybe it could also improve your UI. Yeah. So this is the first filter we've been thinking of. But we've been thinking about another filter. I'm going to enable it here. Let's refresh. This time, you know, we've, we've, been, uh, we've bought uh, Minecraft. So it should work. This is a Minecraft browser, so you're going to understand why. Right? So if I'm looking now for, yes, yeah, much more difficult to, to, to use. And I know this is the second link. So I'm lo loading my website, Babylon.js. So currently it's very fun because I've got HTML, HTML loading SVG, loading HTML with some SVG filter on top of that. And the embedded HTML is using WebGL. So it's completely useless. <laughs> and it depends on the network connection, so it should load. So, And now you've got WebGL being run in a stupid way, using the Minecraft effects, but still running perfectly fine at 60 frames per second, which is awesome. So it's up to you now to find a use case. Um, <laughs> but it's really awesome. So let's finish by something that is really important for me. It's, um, it's about accessibility. So I'm spending a lot of my time in web conferences, like maybe some of you are doing. And I was most of the time sharing what I was doing on WebGL and Web Audio. And I was listening to people sharing best practices around accessibility. And I was feeling stupid because my WebGL content is by default and obviously not accessible to anybody. So, I was discussing with one of my friends in, in France, and he told me it would be awesome if you managed to create an accessible game, uh, a breakout game. And this starts, well, I don't know, I could create that. So I started thinking about how to create such a game. So, and I'm going to share with you the experiment I've been doing. So the first thing I've decided is to, to use SVG first, because I know that SVG scale very, very well by default. So it could be very interesting for people having some uh, visual uh, impairment to use that. And SVG could be also pretty well coup coupled with Ar ARIA, so in case of uh, I need it, so uh, this was my first experiment. And I decided also by default to enable the, um, you know, the visual impaired uh, theme, theme, so I'm using yellow and black background to have a high contrast. And to enable accessibility also, I decided to use Web Audio. So I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to use Web Audio to improve the accessibility. The idea was to be able to play the game using a headset if you're blind or if you're closing your eyes if you want to test it. And just by using the sound, being able to, to figure out where the ball is and what you should do. So what I've been doing first, if you're, if you're completely blind, I've decided to enable great graphics, because you don't care if it's good or not, but if you're one of your friends is not blind, maybe you would enjoy some great graphics while you're going to play. And if you're not blind at all, you don't have any problem, you see the paddle size is narrow, and the speed of the ball will be faster. 
So for, of course, if you can see, it's a bit more difficult for you because you can see. But let's see that. Let's think that I'm blind. So the paddle is wider now. And what I've decided is I'm going to play music. Um, if the ball is aligned vertically, aligned with the paddle, the music will be played as a normal play rate. If the ball starts to leave the paddle zone, I'm going to slow down the music, just to say to the people that um, you're not aligned anymore, and I will slow down more and more the further you are from the paddle. And I will only enable, for instance, if the ball is currently on the left, I will only enable the left speaker or the right speaker for the other things. So, well, I could close my eyes, but I, will, uh, I need a headset to play to the game. So let's try to understand how it works. And last, also, I've been using um, a library to speech, because when you can't blind, you don't know how many bricks are left, or if you lose, or if you win to the game. So let's start. Starting game. You can hear that the music remaining. is going down, because and it's only playing on the right. I don't know about the room. 22 remaining. And the ID? No. 21 remaining. It's still aligned. Oh. I'm not looking up. 20 remaining. And you're going to see that it's going to move on the left. Remaining. Let's activate the left speaker. It's game going over. down. And you tell me that I've lost to the game. And the good news is that I've been trying this game on the real blind user during another French conference. And she's been able to break her first brick. So I was so happy. The first thing she, she, she asked me is what the breakout game is, because she obviously never used it. So it was the first time she was using a, a breakout game. So next step is maybe a FPS game. I don't know. <laughs> Use of works. But it was just to, to tell you that if you're using web audio also, you could um, improve the accessibility of your website if you want to. So just trying to, to figure out some solution to help people access, uh, uh, using your content. Even if it's some great visual, if you find some ideas using web audio, it could be awesome. So feel free to share that. I've, I've published the, the source code of my GitHub also if you want to have a look to that. And uh, I'm quite happy about the, the results. So to conclude, what we are seeking for beyond that, I was telling you that you can go on status.modern.ie to vote for specific features. So it's really the way we are currently listening and having a look to the features based on real-world usage data. So using our being a, a search engine, we are looking to a lot of websites and we're trying to, to search the different APIs being used by the website. So if someone comes and says that um, this new API is awesome, you need to ship it, and we see that only two people in the world are using it, maybe it's not our priority, so we really try to figure out if it's really used or not. It's better also on your developer feedback, because something, even if it's not yet being used, it could be very interesting for the future, so it's based on the discussion we have with you. And it's based also on the stability of the standard, obviously. So we are not shipping in production what's not being completely um, tested. So uh, to do that, we're now using the about flags. And based obviously on development capacity. So you can see that we're currently uh, looking at shadow DOMs and custom elements. It's on our backlog. And we are starting working on the template element part of the web component stuff to, to be shipped in, in the next update of our browser. So feel free to go over there if you want to vote for specific features and to discuss with us. And I'm a bit, I'm OK on the timing. Two minutes left. So I've finished. And I say thank you for your time.